Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Good to be here with you. Great to have you here. So in case you missed episode 49, I talked Ken into letting me interview him for STEM Talk, which is pretty awesome. And because we had such great fun and our conversation went over two hours, we split Ken's STEM Talk into two episodes. During the first part of my interview with Ken, I talked about him being inducted into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Well, he has now officially been inducted, congrats Ken, and joined such illustrious scientists and inventors like Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, as well as IHMC's very own Jerry Pratt and IHMC board chairman Bill Dalton. The induction ceremony was in Tampa. I understand that you had a great time, Ken. Indeed I did, Don. It was a a great event and a great honor. But as uh, Jack Benny once said, I don't deserve this award, but I have arthritis and I don't deserve that either. (laughs) The induction ceremony was, uh, in many ways, sort of humbling, and uh, joining me as a 2017 inductee was my good friend, uh, Dr. Dwayne McKay, who is a member of IHMC's Scientific Advisory Board, and he's also president at Florida Institute of Technology. That's awesome. And in the first part of your interview, listeners got to hear about the research our colleagues do here at IHMC and a little bit about the early days of the Institute. We also got to hear about your childhood and your days as a rock and roll promoter, among other things, as well as your early research into artificial intelligence, which is a term that you're not particularly fond of. Um, listeners learned that you believe amplified or augmented intelligence is a better way to refer to AI. In part two of my interview with Ken, listeners get to hear about Ken's views on topics related to human performance and resilience. In particular, we discussed a ketogenic diet, and we talked about ketone esters and strength training, as well as other ways for people to maintain muscle and strength as they age. Yes, Don, these are areas that I've become particularly passionate about in recent years. But before you start throwing more questions at me, we have some housekeeping to take care of. As we always do. And just to throw it in there, we also talked about Ken's public service and we talked about technological advancement. So it's a really fascinating episode. So we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk. And we especially appreciate all of our listeners who helped STEM Talk win first place in the science category at the recent 12th Annual People's Choice Podcast Awards. <laughs> Woohoo! We also appreciate all the wonderful five-star reviews that have been piling up on iTunes. As we announced in our earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews, with an eye towards selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname Every Rose Has Its Stem. The review is titled, I'm not usually late, but if I am, I had to finish a STEM talk. The review reads, STEM talk is the best podcast. It takes topics that we all should know about or perhaps think we understand and utilizes the greatest interviews of the greatest minds, to actually realize this knowledge. If everyone listened to this podcast, the world would be healthier, happier, and better equipped for life. Thank you so much for this podcast. And thank you, Every Rose Has Its Stem, which is a very creative nickname. (laughs) And thank you to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. And stems have thorns. (laughs) And now on to today's interview with, well, yours truly. Dr. Kenneth Ford is a founder and chief executive officer of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, IHMC, a not-for-profit research institute investigating a broad range of topics relating to building technological systems aimed at amplifying and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Richard Florida has described IHMC as, quote, a new model for interdisciplinary research institutes that strives to be both entrepreneurial and academic firmly grounded and inspiringly ambitious. 
IHMC headquarters are in Pensacola with a branch research facility in Ocala, Florida. Dr. Ford is the author of hundreds of scientific papers and six books. He received his PhD in computer science from Tulane University. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, a charter fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and a member of the Association for Computing Machinery, the IEEE Computer Society, and the National Association of Scholars. In January 1997, Dr. Ford was asked by NASA to develop and direct its new Center of Excellence in Information Technology at the Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, where he also served as Associate Center Director. In July 1999, Dr. Ford was awarded the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal. That same year, Dr. Ford returned to private life in Florida and to IHMC. In October 2002, President George W. Bush nominated Dr. Ford to serve on the National Science Board. In 2004, Florida Trend Magazine named Dr. Ford one of Florida's four most influential citizens working in academia. In 2005, Dr. Ford was appointed and sworn in as a member of the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. Also in 2005, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Bordeaux. In 2007, he became a member of the NASA Advisory Council, and on October 16, 2008, Dr. Ford was named as chairman, a capacity in which he served until October 2011. He was awarded in 2008 the Robert S. Engelmore Memorial Award for his work in artificial intelligence by the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. In 2010, Dr. Ford was awarded NASA's Distinguished Public Service Medal, the highest honor the agency confers. In 2012, Dr. Ford was named to a two-year term on the Defense Science Board. That same year, Tulane University named Ford its outstanding alumnus in the School of Science and Engineering. In 2013, he became a member of the Advanced Technology Board, which supports the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. The Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence named Dr. Ford the recipient of the 2015 Distinguished Service Award. As I mentioned earlier, in 2017, Dr. Ford was elected to the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. STEM talk. STEM, STEM, STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. So some of the work that we are doing for human performance is focused on nutritional approaches, including the ketogenic diet, which we've talked about a lot here on STEM talk and perhaps ketone esters. You were an early adopter of the ketogenic diet and have become such an expert that some people now refer to you as the keto guy. Congratulations on that, yeah. <laughs> that name. Um, Outdoor Magazine had a story last year on ketogenic diets, and the writer actually traveled to Pensacola to talk to you about ketogenic diets and spent a lot of time you know, getting an idea of why you got into the ketogenic diet in the first place. So let's start at the beginning. W- when did you first embrace a ketogenic diet and what attracted you to it? Well, that's a long story, and certainly there are other folks who might be better called the keto guy. (laughs) Not sure I'd wish that on anyone, but um, if we're going to give that moniker to someone, maybe Jeff Volick, who was interviewed on STEM Talk episode 43, is one person who springs to mind (laughs) as having earned the appellation keto guy. (laughs) But, um, you know, I first became aware of the ketogenic diet in the earliest years of the 70s, maybe 71 or 70, something like that. It was while cutting weight for wrestling. I next came across some work by Stephen Finney uh, with elite cyclists in the early to mid 80s. And uh, during the late 80s and most of the 90s, I uh, unwisely went off the diet and had the expected consequences. <laughs> in the uh, early 2000s, I decided to take matters uh, into my hands, and I decided to eat a low-carb diet, not a ketogenic diet, but a low-carb diet, and immediately lost about 40 pounds, stabilizing around 188 pounds. For a former lightweight wrestler, this is way too big. <laughs> And so I was still roughly about 28% body fat and well on my way, I'm sure, to diabetes and much else. By now, I was, uh, frankly, getting quite annoyed uh, with being a pudgy guy. (laughs) And uh, I was also quite annoyed with my interactions with physicians and decided to ignore the received wisdom and sort of uh, get back to what had always worked for me as an athlete, which was the ketogenic diet. And also around that time, I ran into a terrific physician, hello, Dr. Varnador, willing to work with me on what was really, I mean, you can't appreciate how unknown the ketogenic diet was then. 
So within five years of the 28% body fat measurement on the same machine, uh, it dropped to 6.3%. Wow. And uh, that's a little low for me uh, at this age. I typically am always under 10%. And uh, during that same time frame, I gained about 15 pounds of lean mass. So this is probably not a typical trajectory for someone in their 60s. No. Of course, this diet, like any way of eating, is not for everyone, and I would never suggest that it is. But I do think it's of particular value for many in the older aging population in terms of maintaining overall wellness, muscle and strength, and perhaps offering some degree of protection against neurodegenerative disorders. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to 2012, and I was serving on the Defense Science Board, and we were working on a study about warfighter performance and how the human performance of the warfighter and their resilience to stressors might be enhanced. And one of the uh, parts of the study that I was assigned was to review some work that DARPA had funded at NIH. And it was while working on this study, I traveled to NIH and met Dr. Veach and visited his lab several times. The legend. Yeah, the legend, the man himself. <laughs> he had developed a promising ketone ester. And this ester is now moving its way into the marketplace, uh, at least we hope so. This, again, pinged my interest in ketones and uh, opened up thinking about what you might do with exogenous ketones, particularly the esters, which are very efficacious. Also, our colleague, uh, Dominic D'Agostino at the University of South Florida and also has an appointment at IHMC, had funding from the Office of Naval Research to test an ester in mouse models with the eventual aim of preventing seizures in Navy divers using the Drager rebreather. And you know, just as an aside, Dom's lab in Tampa is just a bundle of energy <laughs> and is always looking at all kinds of applications for ketone esters and much else. And uh, Dom was, in fact, the guest on STEM Talk episode 14. Yep. And so for the STEM Talk blurb that we run at the break during the podcast, we talk about how IHMC is a research lab that pioneers technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion and resilience. Would you say that ketogenic diets or even ketone esters are an extension of that? Absolutely. A perfect fit. Especially based off of everything you kind of just said, building into why you're interested in the ketogenic diet and ketone esters. Indeed. I've also heard you talk about how elevating your ketone levels has the potential to protect people from diseases of aging. So you kind of talked about that briefly. Can you talk about the research behind that as well as your own personal experience? Sure. Of course, everyone knows there isn't currently anything like a silver bullet to stop or even greatly slow aging. But, you know, one way to think about it is there are a whole collection of things that we can do to slow it a little. Or as uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Signorelli at the University of Miami likes to say, we can each bend our own aging curve. And that's a nice way to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, simple measures such as exercise and diet can clearly reduce the negative effects of aging and lengthen health span and maybe lifespan. But lifespan without health span is a pretty bleak prospect. Typically, as a society, we tend to wait for various ailments, usually chronic, associated with advancing years to occur. And then we sort of play a game of whack-a-mole, <laughs> trying to address them with prescription drugs and assistive devices and all kinds of rehab. I, I'd rather not play that game until as late in life as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so diet and exercise really can add life to one's years and maybe some extra years too. Now, with respect to ketogenic diet, I don't think it should be surprising that shifting something as fundamental as the fuel substrate for our metabolism would have widespread effects. And indeed, this is what we see, especially for the huge percentage of our population that is overweight or diabetic, or even the larger group that is advancing in age and often becoming increasingly insulin resistant with the years. And it's important to appreciate this is not a small group. This may be most of us. 
Just this week, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, released new statistics that indicate that more than 70% of American adults are now either obese or overweight. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> scary, but it's worse than that. Yeah. Because the 70% are either obese or overweight. Literally 40% are in fact obese. And the childhood obesity rate for kids 6 to 19 is over 20%. For most of these folks, and this is really many or perhaps most of us, the metabolic effect of a well-formulated ketogenic diet would be terrific. Mm -hmm. So lately, there's been a ton of excitement about the effects of ketones that go well beyond the metabolic role and the fact that they might perhaps have an anti-aging effect. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yes, and um, I think I'll have quite a bit to say about this, but uh, <laughs> and this could be a whole other topic for a different day. But I've noticed a trend in podcast land for uh, the ever-growing group of uh, keto experts and pundits to speculate that the level of circulating ketones is not important. I just heard this the other day. And uh, this is completely incorrect from my perspective. Many of the most exciting effects of ketones are not those only dependent on metabolism, but rather on the elevated level of circulating ketones themselves, where in addition to their role as an energy source, they play a critically important signaling function. In particular, you know, we see research that has strongly identified specific signaling functions of both beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, and it seems pretty clear, at least in the mouse models, that they regulate inflammation and gene expression directly, and this has serious implications for health and longevity. In a 2013 article published in the prestigious journal Science, Verdin's lab reported that beta-hydroxybutyrate whether endogenous or exogenous, is a specific inhibitor of class 1 histone diastylases, otherwise known as HDACs, and thereby conferred substantial protection against oxidative stress. In particular, ketone bodies regulate HDAC activity and thereby epigenetic gene regulation as well. This could turn out to be a very big deal, as ketone bodies seem to link environmental cues such as diet, to the regulation of aging. Also, it has long been known that BDNF increases after exercise. BDNF has been shown to enhance mental abilities, reduce anxiety, and increase neuroplasticity. Until recently, however, it was not known how exercise increases the production of BDNF. In a fascinating study, Sleem and Atoll have shown that the aforementioned HDACs inhibit the production of BDNF. And, as we just discussed, beta-hydroxybutyrate inhibits HDACs, thereby increasing BDNF. This relatively recent appreciation of the signaling and other non-energy-related effects of ketone bodies is rather amazing and overlaps with benefits one sees from exercise and intermittent fasting. I'm sure that pharma would love to identify a safe drug having these same effects. And just last month, the journal Cell Metabolism published two excellent papers related to ketones and the extension of health span and lifespan. The first paper was by uh, John Newman and several other researchers at the Buck Institute, as well as a group at UCSF. And uh, the paper was called The Ketogenic Diet Reduces Midlife Mortality and Improves Memory in Aging Mice. But the, and that's an excellent paper, mm -hmm. but the one that really flowed at my boat uh, was by Megan Roberts and her team at the University of California, Davis. And the paper's name was A Ketogenic Diet Extends Longevity and Health Span in Adult Mice. Hmm. So working with mouse models, the researchers saw extended longevity, cognitive protection, cancer reduction, improved strength and coordination, and immune rejuvenation. So even half of that would be a good deal. Yeah, absolutely. And the paper from UC Davis showed a 13% increase in median lifespan for mice on the ketogenic diet. In humans, that would be 7 to 10, something like that, years. But more importantly, from my perspective, those mice retained quality of life 
and strength much further into life. So it's, it's not just an extension of the years, but quality years. Exactly, Don. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'd stress that these are still early days on this topic. These are brand new papers. Mm-hmm. But I'm confident that the research community will continue to peel this onion because this has become a hot topic now and much will be learned in the next couple of years. And of course, you know, we have to note that this work was done in rodents and is not the product of a randomized double blind study, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But what I'll say about that is this. One needs in their own life to make choices based on the current best information. And reasonable people can differ on their standards of evidence. But I am confident that we will be waiting a very long time for some of these studies to be done conclusively in humans, perhaps longer than any of us have, certainly me. So, of course, there is the need for more research, and it's going to happen. But speaking for only myself, I am much more impressed with these animal model research studies than many of the epidemiological studies of humans, which are often taken much more seriously than they should be. Absolutely. And so we're talking about this anti-aging effect. What do we know about the effect of the ketogenic diet explicitly on the maintenance of muscle and strength as we age? Do we know anything about that? Yes. And this is uh, a, an emerging uh, topic, right? Like literally this year, you know, everyone knows that the age-related loss of muscle mass and strength, and they're not the same thing, they're correlated, but not as strongly correlated as was once believed, is a major challenge facing the aging population. And this is a primary interest of mine, but suffice it to say, there are lots of causes of this loss of muscle size and quality. And I'll just run through a few of them, but they range from inactivity to insulin resistance to decreased anabolic hormones coupled with increased anabolic resistance, to elevated myostatin signaling, to the need for more protein with age, to chronic inflammation, to declining autophagy function with age, to mitochondrial abnormalities with age, this age deal doesn't sound good, (laughs) to a reduction in satellite cell number and regenerative capacity, to elevated intercellular oxidative stress, to decreased motor neuron function. This is not even close to the complete list of candidate bad guys with respect to loss of muscle function and size with age. The short answer is that when you look at this list, the ketogenic diet affects a big chunk of these directly and it moves the needle in a positive direction. It doesn't mitigate this entirely. So anabolic resistance is reduced, myostatin is reduced, inflammation is reduced, you know, and a whole bunch of them are like that. So again, in my view, the relative advantage or benefit of the ketogenic diet is greater as we age. Uh, Young people can do almost anything in many cases. And as you get older, you, you benefit more from tightening this up. Earlier, I mentioned the excellent paper by Megan Roberts and the team at the University of California, Davis. And that paper showed that a ketogenic diet, as I mentioned, extends longevity. But the part I liked about the paper was the extension of health span. In particular interest to me, they observed a significant preservation of muscle mass with aging in their mice Hmm. consuming a ketogenic diet. So do they know what the mechanism is behind that? Well, there are probably multiple causes for this. And uh, I just mentioned a whole list of them. But most intriguingly... The investigators found that the ketogenic diet increased protein acetylation levels and regulated mTOR C1 signaling in a tissue dependent manner. And this mm-hmm. tissue dependent manner is critical. So, in skeletal muscle, the ketogenic diet actually increased the P4E BP1 levels, as, and this is associated with the mTOR pathway. While in the liver, they found that the mTOR C1 signaling was substantially inhibited hmm. by the ketogenic diet. So as our listeners know, uh, or many of our listeners may know, the mTOR pathway is considered to be a central regulator of protein synthesis, and its activation is critical for muscle growth and maintenance, but also that chronically elevated mTOR has been found to lead to briefer lifespans in all kinds of animal models. So as the authors noted, there's a lack of sufficient understanding right now in the trade-off between the pro-longevity mTOR modulation and the benefit of activation for the benefit of muscle. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And so this will be a super important topic, but it could be that these mice got a win-win, right? So yeah. they uh, had it activated in a tissue-dependent way and uh, had longer life and were stronger later into life. Wow, so that's really interesting. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. I understand that the ketogenic diet typically reduces circulating levels of IGF-1, which plays a key role in the maintenance of muscle. So why is this not a problem? Well, I can see why reduced IGF-1 might be a concern with respect to muscle maintenance. That said, a fascinating and really largely underappreciated 2016 paper by Zhao and Associates elucidated acetoacetate's role as a signaling metabolite in promoting muscle cell proliferation. In an animal model, acetoacetate potentiated the stimulatory effect of IGF-1 on muscle cell proliferation by sensitizing muscle cells to IGF-1 via upregulating the receptors. Relatively low circulating IGF-1 is, of course, associated with longer lifespan in a wide range of animals. And the ketogenic diet, calorie restriction, and intermittent fasting all substantially reduce circulating IGF-1 levels, approximately 30 to 40 percent, which, although presumably good for longevity, might make one fret about a potential negative effect on muscle protein synthesis. But as mentioned earlier, it seems that acetoacetate upregulates the sensitivity of the receptors themselves. Amazing stuff. This is good news, because as we age, many or perhaps most of us will suffer some degree of anabolic resistance. On a ketogenic diet, skeletal muscle seems to be sensitized to the effects of anabolic hormones and key amino acids such as leucine. Zhao also reported that acetoacetate partially antagonized myostatin. And who doesn't like to antagonize myostatin? (laughs) So I know it's well appreciated that our stem cells can become less effective over time. So what are the implications for muscle in the aging population? Last year, that is 2016, a Spanish and Italian team of researchers published an article in the prestigious journal Nature showing that autophagy is a critical regulator of stem cell fate, with implications for fostering muscle regeneration in sarcopenia as well as other related disorders. Autophagy typically declines with age, and this may cause stem cells to lose their so-called stemminess and become senescent. Interestingly, both fasting and ketogenic diets increase autophagy. This would seem a solid benefit for the aging population. This is absolutely fascinating. Ken, so we're talking about the ketogenic diet, so just kind of taking a step back, and I know this is a question that you get very often. Uh, What is the ketogenic diet from your perspective? Yeah, it's one of my least favorite questions, (laughs) but uh, I'll forgive you for this. The... um, yeah, and, the, and you listen to people blather on about what is a ketogenic diet. And um, most diets, you can have a big argument about what the diet is. You know, like, what is the Mediterranean diet? Well, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean anything. It means groovy and yum and healthy. Olive oil. Yeah, yeah <laughs> olive oil. People in the Mediterranean eat all different kinds of things, you know, from pasta to fish. You know, it's, it's a diverse diet. Mm-hmm. The ketogenic diet is unique in the way that there is a functional definition that's objective. So a ketogenic diet is one that induces a state of ketosis, period. One can measure this with a simple finger stick blood test. Pretty simple. Now, this is not to imply that any diet that induces a state of ketosis is equally healthy, right? You could you know, drink, uh, uh, you know, a jar of, uh, I don't know, peanut oil. You'd be in ketosis, but you wouldn't necessarily be healthy. So that's a separate argument. Right. But when you ask somebody, what is a ketogenic diet? The first thing is, is it a diet that induces ketosis? And we're all different. So some of my friends and colleagues have to be really, really strict, uh, much stricter than I do, with their carbohydrates to maintain ketosis because I've been doing it so long. Mm -hmm. Also, if you engage in a lot of exercise, you can get away with a little more carbs. But when we're talking about carbs, we're talking about things like, you know, arugula and and kale. We're not talking about bread. And it's important to note that one size does not fit all. But I like that there's an objective test 
that I can do and then correlate that with my subjective feelings of wellness, which is what really matters. Mm -hmm. So after you've been doing it a long time, you know how you feel and you know whether you're probably in ketosis or not. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting that last year, Google searches for ketogenic diets overtook searches for paleo diet. It's one of Google's fastest growing search trends. So did you ever think that ketogenic diets would become so popular back in 2006 when you returned to this way of eating? No, I couldn't even imagine it. I mean, it was something you didn't bring up, right? Like people would say, oh, I noticed you didn't eat the bread. Uh, you must be following Atkins. I'm just, oh, okay, you know, whatever. Yeah, sure. I didn't want to get into it. and. If you start telling people about beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, their eyes would fog over <laughs> and um, they would deem you a boring dinner guest. <laughs> so uh, I would just tell them, well, I've returned to my old, very low-carbohydrate way of eating and I wouldn't uh, go on much about it. Frankly, uh, its current popularity is somewhat surreal from yeah. my perspective. But I, I'm largely happy about it in that if it's described properly and if it's a well-formulated version of the ketogenic diet, I'm sure it will help many people and there'll be great benefit. And Lord knows we need it. Mm -hmm. Just walk around Walmart or the airport and, you know, ketogenic diet would help a lot of those folks out. <laughs> Um, with its great popularity has become a whole industry of uh, people who just heard the word two years ago, and now they're on their second book. Yeah, that too. <laughs> and so moving away from what you're eating, I know that you are an advocate of resistance training generally and blood flow restriction training in particular, which we've talked about here on STEM Talk a number of times. What do you see as the primary benefit of blood flow restriction and how do you use it in your training? That's a good question. And I'm glad you asked it. Uh, it's important to note, of course, that we're talking about blood flow restriction, not blood flow occlusion. Mm -hmm. And so in blood flow restriction training, you know, you, you use pressure cuffs on the limbs uh, as high up as possible on the limb. And the pressure should be sufficient to maintain arterial inflow. That's critical while occluding venous outflow of blood distal to the occlusion site. And it's not true occlusion, as I said, it's restriction. Mm -hmm. So for those that really want to take a deep dive into blood flow restriction training, I invite you to listen to STEM Talk episode 34, where we interview Jim Stray Gunderson, perhaps the leading authority on this subject. But although the the specific mechanism of action responsible for the benefits of BFR are not completely certain. It's been theorized that mechanical tension and metabolic stress signal a number of downstream mechanisms for the induction of muscle growth, including reduced protein breakdown, accumulations of metabolites, decreased myostatin, myostatin seems to come up a lot, suppression of FOXO transcription, and the proliferation of satellite cells, an increased fast-twitch fiber recruitment, cell swelling, and the production of reactive oxygen species along with its variants, mm -hmm. including nitrous oxide and heat shock proteins and much else. So this is a long list, mm -hmm. and I sure forgot a big part of the list, and nobody knows the relative contribution of each of these. But I find it fascinating and efficacious and particularly useful when working to recover from injury and in the aging population. You know, so I currently have an elbow injury. And um, with blood flow restriction training, you use a roughly, I mean, there's a lot of variation, but think roughly in terms of one-fifth the weight. So you're not putting large loads into the skeleton or into an injured area. and also. It seems to have an enhanced healing effect to some extent. And uh, there's a project that is just going to get started next month, led by Dr. Adam Anz at the Andrews Institute. And uh, Jim Stray Gunderson, who I mentioned earlier, and I will be part of the team. And we're going to look at whether blood flow restriction training is increasing mobilization of stem cells. And Adam has hypothesized that part of this observed healing and recovery effect that I mentioned could be a consequence of increased stem cell activity. And if that's the case, that's very interesting as well. I think that's going to be a really interesting study to follow. So Ken, talk about some of the other approaches that you've started using in your training to optimize muscle mass while minimizing potential injury. 
Well, I'm an eclectic kind of guy. <laughs> So, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like kettlebells and I like electrical muscle stimulation devices, particularly the power dot unit is by far the most efficacious for me, at least. You know, I mostly engage in whole body resistance training with occasional Tabata sessions on a, maybe on the rowing machine or something like that. But other than hiking in Wyoming and Maine, I do tend to favor resistance training. Mm -hmm. I often use hierarchical sets, and uh, I hadn't even known uh, that I have a friend that uses the same method, and that's Art Devaney. And uh, as many of you know, Art was our guest on episode 30, mm -hmm. and he's a really fascinating fellow. And can you elaborate a little bit more on the hierarchical set method of resistance training? Sure. And, you know, and to get started, of course, there are lots and lots of approaches to resistance training. There's nothing new under the sun there. And most of them will provide benefit. But I do like this method. And uh, the hierarchical method, uh, and there are variants in this, but the method that I do is it's a three set method for each lift. And typically, uh, the first set is around 15 reps. The second set, then has more weight added, and it's eight reps. And again, this is, you know, you want the 15 to be close to all you could do, right? And then the next set, you add a bunch of weight. So now you can only do eight. And then the third set, it's, you know, four or five and a lot more weight, all right? Mm -hmm. And this is a relatively safe method. And essentially, the early set is a warm-up. And if it's done properly, it, you can hit the fast twitch muscle fiber by fatiguing out the slow twitch fibers in the early sets. And that's one of the goals for the early sets. Mm -hmm. And do you go to failure on these? No, okay. uh, I hate to fail. And uh, <laughs> we I know that too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make that a habit. And uh, so going to failure also can lead to poor form. And uh, poor form, when that occurs, this is typically, you know, when you're most prone to injury. Mm -hmm. So I always leave one or two reps in the tank. This method does not involve long rests between the, the sets, and it involves knowing yourself well enough to know, hey, I've still got one in the tank, but probably not three, yeah. right? Uh, you know, and for me at this point in my life, uh, my first goal in the gym is to avoid injury. Everything else is secondary to that. Yeah, you want to keep going. Um, are, do you have any thoughts on eccentric movements in resistance training? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that. Nobody ever does. Uh -huh. You know, I'm, I'm a fan, actually, of well-chosen uh, eccentric movements, and I occasionally still use them. Uh, I used to use them a lot when I was a young, uh, younger person. Um, they're particularly easy to do on some of the leg machines, like a leg press machine. It's quite convenient. One often goes to a gym and the leg press machine only goes to some weight like 400 or something. And uh, with using eccentric movements, what you can do is you can push the weight up with both legs and then just lower it with one leg. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we can all lift uh, much less than we can lower. So you can use both legs to push it up and then lower it with one. And uh, this is true for a whole wide range of movements. It's just that with eccentrics, some of the movements are hard to do safely or require lots of help. Like mm -hmm. think about heavy eccentric squats. So how would the bar ever get up? Yeah. You know, you would need... Uh, a uh, very strong gentleman, uh, and probably two of them, right? Dating <laughs> you. And <laughs> <laughs> STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Yeah. So while we're talking about uh, eccentric movements, isn't it true that Peter Newhouse here at IHMC is doing work developing exercise technologies for advanced space missions or deep space missions? Yes. And uh, it's exciting work. I, I think uh, it will have a real application not only in space, but here on Earth. And uh, this technology uses uh, force control motors, sophisticated force control motors that allow you to vary the load based on any parameter that you find interesting. So it could be 
you know, vary with heart rate or randomly vary or, and you can do eccentric squats as we were just talking about without hazard. And um, I imagine that this kind of technology will be the future of uh, resistant training machines. It's really exciting. So Ken, kind of moving topics a little bit, when you and I first met, I was doing research on APOE or apolipoprotein E in a neurocritical care laboratory at Duke University. And we were doing research and you and I talked about the relevance of APOE genotype and Alzheimer's disease and patient outcome uh, following different types of acute brain injury and chronic brain injury and neurodegenerative disease processes. Let's talk about your take on APOE and athletics and other approaches when it comes to harnessing our genetic information for optimized health. Yes, uh, I, I find the whole genetic uh, testing as it relates to athletics uh, both fascinating and in some cases overhyped. You know, the, there's books about, well, if you have this gene, then and you can never do X, you know. Mm-hmm. And I hope in the future, you know, kids aren't sorted by their genes. Yeah. You know, well, you're on the wrestling team. Why? Because you have these genes. Yeah, but I hate wrestling. You know? <laughs> right. I don't know. I, I, I don't think that's a bright future. Yeah. But uh, it is fascinating. And you mentioned APOE, and that's one of the most interesting. And uh, you see it, as you mentioned, in disease and essentially uh, people with, as you know better than I, the APOE 4-4 arrangement or even a 3-4 at much greater risk for neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, but also to uh, trauma to the brain, you know, either through sport or an automobile accident. And uh, this uh, is overrepresented in some populations uh, that you see uh, as strong participants in sports that evolve being hit in the head. So uh, there's kind of a cruel joke uh, there. It's not a funny joke. Uh, It's ironic. And I think uh, this APOE status needs to be taken into account in the future in sports like, particularly sports like uh, football, um, boxing, uh, but other sports as well. You know, if a person finds that they're an APOE 4-4, uh, they should, I, in my view, be permitted to play whatever sport they like, but they should be informed. And if they're young, their parents should be informed mm-hmm. of the status. And right now, this is typically not tested for in athletes. And here's to hoping that one day we'll have some kind of prophylactic approach to those with a 4-4 or 3-4 genotype. Um, so, Ken, let's talk about a typical day and a typical week, which I don't know if you have any of those in your life, but in the life of Ken Ford. Uh, first of all, what does your diet look like, and what do you typically eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Well, you're right. There's <laughs> there's no typical. I actually like not having typical. So I, I'm a big believer in sort of uh, change things and surprise myself. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I typically like to confine my eating window into a compressed time slot. So I like really early dinners, as everyone who knows me knows. And I like to skip breakfast most of the time, but not all the time, because I, I just like to be variable and sort of stochastic variation in my behavior. And uh, I normally uh, work out in a fasted condition, mm-hmm. and I find that advantageous. I'm a real early to bed, early to rise kind of guy. I'm no fun at parties. I, uh, <laughs> I like to get up early, uh, real super early. And study research results for a couple hours every morning. And then I sort of, uh, I intermingle with the reading, uh, the making of espresso on our La Marzocco GS3 espresso machine. And you asked me about food. Well, I typically, you know, love things like uh, really high quality olive oil, which I tend to put on all kinds of things. Uh, Wild fish and pheasant and high quality eggs. I love broccoli sprouts in particular with olive oil, uh, lamb, duck, elk, venison, grass-fed beef, avocado. Arugula is a big hit with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I eat a varied diet, a large amount of vegetables and a large amount of protein, lots of good fats, and uh, very little uh, carbohydrate except the carbohydrates in the green vegetables. Mm-hmm. And incredibly clean eating, too. Yes. Um, You talked about espresso. Just how many espressos, which you happen to refer to as the elixir of the mind, do you drink in a day? 
Well, <laughs> uh, I am according to my genetics. You brought genetics up, so yep. it's fair for me to mention it's it. It's on me. I am a hyper metabolizer of caffeine, so uh, I clear it out of my system very quickly. Uh, but even so, I try not to enjoy much uh, espresso late in the day. I, I haven't kept track of how many espressos, but, you know, I share them in the morning with Nancy. It's more fun to share. Mm-hmm. But during the day at work, I'll have another two or three, but not late in the day. And lately, for the last six months or a year, I've been uh, enamored with Pu'er tea, and I've been really digging in hard on Pu'er and finding some wonderful sources, and that's been a lot of fun. Okay, Ken. So beyond IHMC, AI, rock and roll, wrestling, among a lot of other things, and I'm, I'm, I keep telling you that I'm waiting for the book to be written or the books to be written— Um, You've held numerous prestigious positions leading our nation's science programs. So just to start off, you helped develop the NASA Center of Excellence in Information Technology at NASA Ames, and you served as Associate Center Director. So what did that position entail? Well, it was uh, both fun and challenging, and uh, NASA Ames Research Center is NASA's, uh, you know, I guess you would characterize it as more focused on basic research as well as IT, of course. It's located in Silicon Valley. I still have a soft spot for that place, and uh, it it was a great experience. It it was a chance to reimagine some aspects of the center and think hard about how computer science could enhance its contribution to the space program, in particular to deep space probes and uh, robotic missions. Yeah, we could do another STEM talk just on all the experiences you had there, too. Um, so you were then named to the prestigious National Science Board by President Bush in 2002 and later confirmed by the Senate. So for our listeners, the National Science Board is the governing board of the National Science Foundation, and it plays an important role in advising the president and Congress on science policy issues. So, Ken, what was that experience like? And what's a just share a memorable story for us from the NSB that you can that you can share on air. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, it was a relatively amazing experience, mostly because of the quality uh, and character of the colleagues on the National Science Board. In terms of stories, of course, there are many. You know, what, one of the things I found interesting was I was the only computer scientist, so I, I you know, received all the computational sorts of things to review. Uh, and that wasn't that interesting for me because it's my own field, right? And, uh, you know, I knew it was my job to do it and I was pleased to do it. Mm-hmm. But um, one of my closer friends on the board was on an early episode of STEM Talk, Barry Barish. And uh, Barry is a physicist. Uh, in fact, he just received the Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. And Barry, uh, being uh, one of the most accomplished physicists in the United States, at Caltech, he naturally had conflicts of interest for many of the very large-scale projects that come before the National Science Board. Mm -hmm. So if a project's, you know, very large, not a PI-driven project, but a national effort, then these kind of things are racked and stacked and prioritized by the National Science Board, and then Congress typically funds them in that order. And uh, it was really great. At first, I was dismayed, but I later just loved that Barry was conflicted out of reviewing all of these or most of these. Mm -hmm. So the much less knowledgeable uh, person, uh, it fell to me often. And uh, this was such great fun. And because you would get to learn a lot about the front edge of a topic that's outside your field. And uh, you just hoped that you made the right judgments and you availed yourself of the expertise that was available to you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the whole process of watching LIGO happen and go through the funding process and through the arguments, um, that was particularly interesting. And it was wonderful to see the news that Barry and two of his colleagues uh, did, in fact, receive the Nobel Prize for detecting gravitational waves. So incredibly impactful. It's really cool. So in 2007, you were named to the NASA Advisory Council, and then about a year later, you were named as the chairman of this council. So what did that position entail? Well, that was perhaps my favorite board position, though it's, you know, you don't want to have favorites with your kids, you know, but <laughs> they, uh, I particularly enjoyed working with Mike Griffin, 
uh, who was also on STEM Talk. Seems mm-hmm. like everyone has been. But uh, <laughs> we have a lot of <laughs> well, listeners could start here and just start going off into the different STEM Talks. <laughs> yeah. And so Mike was the administrator uh, for the first part of my term on the board. And, you know, he was a great guy for the board to work with. And then my predecessor as chairman was Jack Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt. Uh, the Apollo 17 astronaut and U.S. senator, and he's also been on STEM Talk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jack left big shoes to fill, right? If you follow Jack Schmidt, you pay attention. He's a rock star. Yeah, he's, he was a tremendous chair, in my view. And so, I, I, you know, my background at NASA, this was uh, an, a wonderful uh, board to work on. There were, of course, frustrating aspects because, you know, NASA is very much in the political eye. But overall, it was a great experience. So, Ken, you've also been a member of the Air Force Science Advisory Board, the Advanced Technology Board for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and you were selected to the Defense Science Board for a two-year appointment. So, essentially, you've held a leadership hand in the direction of every facet of science in our country, which is pretty cool. So, what have been some of the takeaways that you've gained in this wide range of national leadership positions? One of the big takeaways for me is that as a nation, we should still strive to do great things. Mm -hmm. You know, as a nation, we seem to hit our peak in terms of ambition sometime in the late 60s or early 70s. And uh, I'm proud that great nations do great things. And uh, LIGO is a great thing, but uh, even larger scale adventures. Uh, should be undertaken. And uh, NASA is one of the agencies that should be doing that. Um, And it's important that we don't become confused when we hear big sounding numbers. You know, so whenever I would speak to a reporter about some space mission, the reporter would then ask him lots of questions and I would provide lots of answers. Mm Mm-hmm. And the first sentence in every article was the same. The first sentence would say, say if we're talking about a deep space mission that was just a technology demonstrator, inexpensive mission, the article would say the $300 million probe. Mm -hmm. And then if you're talking about a big mission, it would say the $4 billion. And uh, they don't explain that that cost is over a 15-year development period. And uh, the deep space mission costs less than one jet fighter. Exactly. Uh, they've, they completely have lost perspective on this. And even if you tell them, which I did, uh, they would smile and agree, but still start with that lead. That misleads the public significantly. So I understand that during the Apollo program, NASA was roughly 4% of federal spending. Do you happen to know what the current situation is? NASA is roughly four-tenths of one percent of federal spending, hardly a budget buster. Pundits and politicos often raise the question of whether we should be spending all this money in space when we have so many problems here on Earth. And this, of course, is the purest nonsense. Every NASA dollar is spent here on Earth, supporting thousands of engineers and scientists and all kinds of other folks. There is no place to spend money in space, at least not yet. (laughs) The other thing that I've noticed over the years is that we're we're making public service increasingly unpleasant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to want to have uh, an efficient, streamlined, and perhaps smaller government. It's another thing to make the people that work there miserable. Mm -hmm. Um, Because what you'll end up with is the best people will leave. Right. This is accelerating every year. So if one ne'er-do-well uh, has an error in judgment, then new rules are promulgated that apply to everyone in government. And the supposition seems to be they're guilty going in. In other words, uh, the degrees of freedom have been so reduced and so tightened up that you end up losing your best people and constraining the creativity and innovation of those who remain. Yeah. So those are... Uh, I mean, they sound negative, I guess, but um, I'm not trying to make it sound negative. I'd like, I like to get back to doing great things, and we still do great things. But the, uh, the, 
the bold uh, swagger has been taken down a bunch of notches. I think those are great take-home points. So, Ken, as a technologist who lives at the front edge, does it seem, as we constantly hear, that technological progress is accelerating at an ever-increasing pace? Yes. I mean, you, you almost can't, well, I was going to say, you almost can't listen to television, but I don't have a television. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't have a television. So. <laughs> yeah, it'll eat your brain. But uh, no, uh, I hear this every day. I mean, and I deal a lot with reporters and uh, they always ask me things about this. And uh, I'm not at all sure about this. And, and, and perhaps technological change is accelerating. And by many measures it is. Mm -hmm. But change is not the same phenomena as progress. Mm -hmm. So you asked about technological progress, and that's a different thing. And of course, if one limits it to consideration of topics related to and enabled by IT, sure, it might be very easy to feel this way. But, you know, I'm less sanguine about that pronouncement. I'm just not sure. My evaluation function for whether something is progress fundamentally has to do with whether it elevates the human condition. Are we better animals than before? Are we smarter, stronger, happier? Are we living in a better culture? Not just is it a new technology. Mm -hmm. Because we can do something as technologists doesn't mean that we should do that thing. So uh, essentially, I support a human-centered view of progress. When I listen to reports, I wonder, are we moving closer to uh, the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein's ideal human? or to something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don, do you remember uh, Heinlein's description of an ideal human? I, I, uh, I took notes for this interview and I, I, uh, I wrote it down here. So I, I will tell you what he said. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. So this is describing the minimum skill set of a, of a human. He says, a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. And this list might seem dated and prosaic today, but I would challenge most of us to see how we do on that list. Absolutely. And you could make a modern day version of that list. And, uh, you know, a modern day version of that list, what would be on it? Would it say that a successful human should maintain a good Facebook presence <laughs> and avoid ideas that one finds uncomfortable? I hope not. I, I agree with you on that. But... From a purely technological point of view, apart from your human-centered perspective, are we not advancing faster than ever before? I'm just unsure. Um, I'll have to think about this more. Yeah. You know, the, early, uh, the years of greatest technological progress seem to have been, to me, the 20th century, actually. Uh, genius. Uh, and, and there were previous periods of great technological progress. Previous to the United States in the 20th century, earlier than that, you had a a period in Great Britain where you had Newton and many other great geniuses flowering at the same time. Mm -hmm. A genius seems to blossom in certain places at certain times for reasons largely unknown. But for quite a while as a technologist, I felt sort of lonely in my perspective, which is generally not shared by my colleagues in technology. Mm -hmm. But recently, uh, Peter Thiel and Tyler Cowen and others uh, have made similar observations. You know, but if you consider the years from 1900, and really I have in mind 1903, but I'll say 1900, <laughs> to 1970. So that's a mere 70 years. It's shorter than a long human life, mm -hmm. right? In that tiny window, we see the birth of heavier-than-air flight, television, antibiotics, atomic bombs, nuclear energy, interstate highways, jet travel, and a human moon landing. So we went in 70 years from the Wright brothers barely bouncing along over the beach to landing on the moon, as well as the advent of computers, right? And much else that mm -hmm. I've neglected to mention. Mm -hmm. 
that's a pretty impressive 70 year stretch. And I wonder if we take the 70 years from 1970 forward 70 years, what our list will look like. And I'm not at all sure that it will stand up to that. Yeah. And all of those things I just mentioned, you know, it's fair to say they've advanced technologically over the years. But the human experience of these things has often regressed in recent years. So commercial air travel is a good example. It's no faster than it was in 1960s. And it's clearly less pleasant. I was going to say. <laughs> I would assert that television is essentially a harmful device that has become much more so over the years. You know, Peter Thiel, uh, I mentioned him a moment ago, once famously held up his cell phone while giving a talk and said, I don't consider this to be a technological breakthrough, he said. Compare this with the Apollo space program. Mm. And, you know, that resonated with me, as you can imagine. And I've often pondered about this, uh, you know, a whole generation of scientists and engineers were first motivated by Sputnik and then another group motivated by Apollo. Now, many of our brightest young people coming out of the best universities aspire to make a nice smartphone app right. or work at Facebook where they employ thousands of bright young computer scientists. I'm not sure that that's progress. My perspective, for sure. I should note that progress is in the eye of the beholder, and its estimation is shaped by the values of our society. So maybe that's just a nice way of saying I'm a grumpy old man. <laughs> well, we can leave it at that, but I think that was a really great answer. Um, so, Ken, in a previous interview, you talked about the need to live a passion-driven life. But you also talked about the zombie apocalypse. So here's an audio clip of that. So my third recommendation was, and this is the, the one that is a yawner, I'm sure, is uh, live a passion-driven life. Uh, pe attitude is everything. Uh, most people I know are, uh, you know, they're, they're worried about the zombie apocalypse. I think it's already happened. Uh, just walk down the street. People are hardly even alive. Live a passion-driven life. Uh, you know, I like to rejoice in the extreme unlikelihood and fragility of my own existence. If you think about, you know, the chance of your existence in the state you're in now, it's vanishingly unlikely to have happened. Literally thousands of pairs of your ancestors had to be smart enough and good enough looking to find mates and <laughs> propagate. This is all just phenomenally unlikely. And uh, I, I love all that about the story. I love that story and I love that advice. Can you expand on that? Sure. People talk about the zombie apocalypse. And I actually met a guy recently and he was telling me about all his preparations for the zombie apocalypse. And I didn't want to over encourage him to tell me more. I, mean, I was, <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Time for me to go. But uh, I, I, uh, I couldn't let it go. And so I said, well, it's too late. Your preparations are all in vain. And he looked very unhappy, uh, and uh, he had a lot of preparations for the zombies. And I said, it's too late. They're all around us. The, just walk down the street. You're surrounded by zombies. Yeah. And you should be nice to them because zombies do bad things to people. But, um, you know, I go to the gym. Of course, there are no gyms anymore. You know, gyms used to have, like, boxing rings and wrestling mats, and gyms had you know, gymnastic equipment, you know, now they're fitness centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to my local fitness center and uh, the people are camped out on the elliptical machine watching TV. And I notice, I say, yep, oh, yep, apocalypse is upon us. <laughs> the zombies are all around. They're in training. <laughs> yeah. So when I say live a passion driven life, I mean, don't be a zombie. This yeah. isn't a dress rehearsal. You don't get to do this again, yeah. you know, contrary to rumor. Uh, this is it. Uh, love it. Uh, chew it up. You know, don't leave anything on the table. Yeah, Be like the, the wrestler that gets to the water fountain after the match. Mm -hmm. This happened to me. And I, uh, I could still hear the crowd roaring. And I go over to get a drink of water. And I was too weak to turn 
the water fountain on. Wow. You know, the rotating handle the old porcelain water fountains mm-hmm. had. Mm-hmm. And a policeman had to come over and hold the handle so I could get some water. And I, uh, the policeman said, wow, you, you know, you're so tired. It's terrible. And I thought, no, it's just right. Yeah. I maxed out because one of our mutual friends says own the day. Exactly. (laughs) Well, Ken, this has been absolutely great fun. I'm glad that we got the chance to do this. So thank you so much for being our guest on STEM Talk. Well, it was great, Don, and uh, I always enjoy talking to you, but this was an unusual experience. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll probably be doing it again sometime. (laughs) STEM Talk. STEM STEM Talk. Talk. STEM STEM Talk. STEM STEM Talk. Well, Ken, that was even more fun than the last interview. Can you believe that we now have 50 episodes under our belt? That's crazy. It seems like just yesterday that we were interviewing Peter Atia for episode number one. I guess time flies when you're having fun. You're right. It's hard to believe that we're now on episode 50. And, you know, I must say that, as you note, it has been a lot of fun doing STEM Talk. The guests have truly been fascinating. Absolutely. If you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes, stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.